Today I'm excited to show you this bandage switch that has 24 gigabit ports and four 10 gigabit SFP plus ports. It's completely fanless, has dual power supplies for redundancy and a price that may surprise you. If you want to know more about this managed switch, then stick around and watch the rest of this video. And of course, if you haven't already done so, please hit that subscribe button and click on the notifications icon so you'll be notified of any future content. So full disclosure before we get into this device is that FS did reach out to me and they did send me this switch for review. They didn't have any input or influence on this video and the content and opinions results are my own. FS has not seen this video before it was published. Now that we got that out of the way, let's take a look at the hardware. So besides the switch itself, it comes with the serial console cable, the mounting brackets, some rubber feet, and the screws. It also comes with the two power cables and the ground cable. So let's cover the basic port configuration. So we have our 24 gigabit ports along the front. So we have four of the SFP Plus ports, which we'll get into a little bit later. Then we have two additional ports here. One is for the console, which is for that serial or console cable that it comes with. And one is a direct LAN management port, which again, as we get into the configuration, we'll talk more about. In the back, we have two power plugs um, for the redundant power supply. So we have one of these on each side. The first thing that we need to do is to plug an Ethernet cable directly into the management console. That way, that will allow us to get into the web UI and make the configuration changes that we need to. To actually access the management console, you have to change your uh, IP address temporarily to a static IP so that you can access the default IP of 192.168.1.1. To do this, just edit your network properties and set it to a manual IP address and then type in an IP address above the dot one. So I used 192.168.1.2 and you can set the subnet to 255, 255, 255, 0. Don't worry about the DNS settings right now. I just left it to automatic um, since this is just temporary while we access the management console. Once you do that, you save your configuration and you should be able to do, you know, go into your browser and access the management console with the 192.168.1.1 default address. So once you log into the switch, this is the first screen that you'll see. Across the top, you'll see some main navigation buttons, starting with the page that we're on. We'll have the configure option, maintenance, and some networks. And there's a lot of options on these, so we're only gonna cover some of the basics. So let's start with the configuration screen. Here you have the option of turning on jumbo frames. Under the port, you kind of get a listing of all the current ports, whether they're enabled or not, and kind of what's happening with them. If we look at the top, you can see that we have port information, but besides that, we have also option to configure our ports, get a status of the transceiver, which if I look at number 28, you can see all the details on my particular one that I have attached to it. There's an option for a cable test and so on. We're not gonna go through all of these. Statistics, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on, but you have a full level of statistics on the switch. We're gonna skip port mirroring, ERPS. You do have the option to do some link aggregation on this. I haven't actually tested the link aggregation, and let's go down to VLAN. So VLANs is a little bit interesting because of how they actually approach it. Um, once you figure it out, it actually makes sense. But it's again, a little different than some of the switches that I've used in the past. The other thing is some of the terminology may not be consistent across the other manufacturers. So if you're used to using either a QNAP or a Netgear or some of the other switches, you might be a little confused at first by looking at the way they've named things, but once you kind of click around and take a look at it, it makes sense. And again, this is, uh, I think initially was aimed at, at the enterprise level. So from here, this is actually in, in chronological order, which makes it nice because a lot of the switches are kind of all over the place. So if you want to create a new VLAN, we'll click on new and basically just type in and, uh, the port, the VLAN ID number. So we're going to type 40 for this particular example. 
click apply and that's it. This allows you to create multiples at the same time. So unlike other switches where you have to go through each step one by one, this one actually lets you step through and do several at the same time. So I'm going to go ahead and close this. And there's our 40. It's, it's currently listed there. So if we look at the members list now, we can see that if I look under 40, there are no members. If I look under 80, which is the other one I created earlier, you can see it has three two ports attached to it. So now let's go over to member setting. Member setting is where we actually define which ports we want to actually assign to the VLAN. So in this particular example, let's go back to the member list real quick. We can see that I previously, under the 80, I assigned ports 13 and 14. So now if we go to member setting, I'm going to assign ports 15 and 16. So if I go to port, I can say 15 to 16. I'm going to leave it at joined and hybrid. I'm going to give it a VLAN ID of 40. And it's going to be untagged. And I'll give it a VLAN ID of 40. Hit apply. And now when we go to members list, we can see now that we have two ports, 15 and 16. And we'll test that out just to make sure. Okay, so there's one more thing we got to do in this to create a trunk connection so that the switches can communicate with one another. So we're going to do that by going to 28, which is my uplink port. And here under mode, we're going to pick 1Q trunk. And we're going to hit apply. Okay, so now if we look at our members list, if we look at VLAN 40, we can see that we have a trunk connection that's tagged. If we look at the VLAN 80 that I did, we also have a trunk connection that's tagged. And if I go back to VLAN 1, which is the default, that has an untagged connection. So now let's test this out and make sure that all the proper IPs work and that we have isolation between the VLANs that we, or that I particularly in this example, want to do. So let's test that the uh, ports that we set up or the VLANs that we set up actually work and do what they're supposed to do. To do that, I'm going to plug my laptop into each of the groups that we set up. So both uh, VLAN 40 and VLAN 80, as well as any of the default ports that, that we left as the default or VLAN 1, just to make sure that everything is recognized. So in theory, I should be able to plug my laptop into those any one of those three groups and get assigned the proper IP address. Now remember, this only works if, if you set up your VLAN across the board. So your router or your DHCP server, whatever you're using in your particular network, also has to have the VLAN interface to interpret that traffic already set up. In my case, I use VLAN 40 and 80 for my IoT and my family network, so they've already been configured. We're testing now that the switch was configured correctly and actually tapping into those. For the first test, I've actually plugged into one of the random ports that is not on the VLAN, and as you can see, I'm getting a 192.168 dot zero dot one five three address which is correct because that is the default subnet so next i'm going to move over and plug in the port 14 because remember we set up 13 and 14 to be on vlan 80 and as you can see i'm getting my 192.168.80.105 ip address which is correct and lastly i'm going to plug into port number 16 because again we configured port 15 and 16 to be VLAN 40, and I'm getting a 192.168.40.100 IP address, which is also correct. So as you can see, all the VLANs are now properly working and traffic is flowing through all of them. So the basic configuration of the switch has been successful. We're gonna skip most of this voice VLAN, and the rest of this stuff is actually more advanced features that you can actually explore on your own. Going across the top, we have the maintenance screen. And here's where you can actually set some details on the switch. So you can give it a name, location, system contact, anything you might want to add. Again, this is probably not all that useful in a small business or home environment, but it's certainly helpful when you have 
a pile of switches in an enterprise. Under user management, it's pretty obvious. You can set up different users and different levels of access. I'm going to jump down here to time setting. Again, here you have to manually configure an SNTP port so that it can pick up the correct time. And of course, the system maintenance. And this is where, where you actually maintain the firmware, reboot the system. So let's get into the firmware upgrade. This is probably the, one of the areas where I struggled a little bit only to understand their philosophy on firmware upgrades, which when you figure it out, does make some sense, but it's not all that straightforward. So for starters, if you look at the system maintenance, you'll see that there's a few files listed there, one of which is a, actually a factory default configuration. But in order to upgrade the firmware, their process is to actually upload the new image file or the new bin file to the switch and basically reassign which of the images you used to boot. And that'll make more sense here in just a little bit. The approach they used is a little different. It's different than anything I've seen anyway. But at the end of the day, it worked out really well. It's just a question of understanding how to do it. So I'm going to walk you through how I did it. All the instructions that I received on this were in well, basically referring to the command line interface. So I kind of figured this out on my own and it sort of does make some sense. It's actually similar to something like a Sophos firewall, which allows you to upload multiple versions of the image and then select the one you want to boot from. This is the same concept. So to do this, you can actually click on copy and I selected HTTP upload and I chose the file that was on that system that's actually controlling the management console. I put it on a USB drive. So I went and found the file. But in this particular case, the upgrade process has to actually take place with in two separate steps. So the first step is actually to use the upgrade file because the, I guess the differences between 171 and 172 are pretty significant. So you have to do it in two step process. The other thing that is kind of different for me is after you choose the file is you actually have to give it the file name that you want to copy to the device. So you can change it if you want to. Typically it just picks up a default file name with the version. This one allows you to create your own file name. So once you put, I decided to use the same file name, but once you put it in, you basically hit apply, click OK, and it starts the copy process. So I'm going to kind of fast forward through some of this. It doesn't take that long, but I'm not going to have you watch it. And then when it's done, it actually appears in the list of files, but you can't do anything to with it until you actually click on the boot button and select the file that you want to boot from. So in our case, we're going to up, we're going to boot from the upgrade.bin file and then hit apply and then close the file and we'll do our reboot. So once it finishes rebooting, we can now log back into the management console. And as you can see here, the upgrade bin that we just loaded is the active file. So it did boot from the correct version. But now we got to do it again because it's a two-step process. Because of the size of the, uh, the upgrade, it couldn't take it all at once. So we actually have to go in and update the second file. The first thing we got to do before we actually do the second part of this is actually delete the very first version. So the 071 version has to be deleted to make room for the second file. So now we're going to go ahead and repeat the process. This time we're going to choose the, 07, the 172 file. Again, we're going to give it our own name, hit apply, and repeat the boot process. So now it's going to copy that file over. And the reason we had to delete it is because it can only take so many images. So that's why it's a progressive process in this case, is you're going from uh, version 171 to the upgrade, from the upgrade to version 172. So it's all done. We're going to go ahead and reboot. We're going to click on the boot button, and this time we're going to move the active boot file from the upgrade to the 172 version, and then we're going to hit apply. And we'll close the screen and go ahead and reboot the system. And once it reboots, we can log back into the admin console. And if we look at the system status screen or the default screen, we can see that we're now on version firmware version 172. 
So even though it took us a couple of steps, it's actually pretty simple once you figure it out. But it was it if you've not done this approach before, it may take you a little bit of time to figure this out. But all in all, it's pretty straightforward. Um, as I mentioned, some of the other devices I've worked with have a similar concept. The implementation was a little bit more direct and straightforward, but it works. And once you understand it, it's not that big a deal. Before wrapping up, I wanted to take a quick test of the 10 gig ports just to make sure that things were performing as expected. And as you can see from the file copy, the switch didn't hinder performance at all. And I was able to max out the performance of my NAS. This is normally what the performance I would expect on this particular NAS. I'm really glad that FS sent me this switch because I might have missed out and not tried one. Most of the videos I saw on this device made it look really complicated and focused on the command line interface, which is not something I'm really looking for in a switch. It's nice that it's there, but command line is not for me. As it turns out, the web interface is actually really good on this device. The fact that it has a separate management port may be a bit strange at first, but it does add a layer of security, and once you get used to it, it's not that big a deal. Since this device spans from consumer to enthusiast to enterprise, it's great that they made a good web UI as well as added the serial console. This is the first switch I've seen that has 24 gig ports and four 10 gig ports. It's completely fanless, has dual power supplies, for less than switches that have half of its capabilities. I wasn't sure what the outcome of this review would be when I started, but I have to say that I was pleasantly surprised and I really like this switch. There's a couple things I hope they improve, such as the firmware update process, which is a bit strange, and maybe change some of the feature terminology that is a little different than what other manufacturers used, but that's a small price to pay for a value like this. Anyway, if you like this video, please give it a like, and I'll leave some affiliate links below in case you need more information on the Switch. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit that notifications icon. Thanks for watching, and I will see you on the next video.